Welcome to Watching Silent Films. This is Yifang with me and my co-hosts Bob and Lily. Hello. Greetings. Hey, hey. Hello, guys. We're back. It's, it's been a long time, it seems like. At least it seems like to me. I agree. We stopped before the holidays. Or I think yeah. right, right before Thanksgiving. Yeah, maybe. I don't. I can't remember, honestly. I mean, it's now towards the end of February. It's a few days away from the end of February, and uh, I can't even remember. It's got to be before the new year, before the the uh the uh unholy trinity <laughs> all three of us <laughs> have uh have congregated to to do a, a you know silent phone podcast so it's been a while so it's good to hear you guys good to reconvene for what is i think one of the final times um of this podcast um i will get into the details about this i know i said that last time too but i, I kind of want to just shuffle it towards the end and that way we don't have to explain stuff and they have to get into the episode, you know? So we'll push it off towards the end. And um, for the last time, what we're going to do on this podcast is to watch movie and talk about it. And this this week, for the last time, we're going to watch, we have already seen Metropolis, 1927, directed by Fritz Lang. And uh, we're going to talk about it. And before we get there, uh, just a real quick kind of overview of what we've been watching. So Lily, you said you watch a bunch of stuff. So why don't you go first? Okay, so for the contemporary area or like or time period, excuse me, I did finally get I found online the man who laughs um, with Conrad Veidt. Uh, my paper is not down here. I believe it's nineteen twenty eight. Uh, that is such a heart wrenching feature. Like I was not expecting it. They call it a silent horror in a respect, but I, it was. It really is a gripping movie, and it's so like more sad than you would expect it to be. Because we've talked about this film on the podcast before. Uh, the Joker from modern day Batman is based on this character as well, mm -hmm. and you think it's supposed to be more gritty and horrifying, which I mean it is, but I was more surprised. Well, the comic book was based on him, like the original but, yeah. DC comic book character was mm -hmm. was inspired, I think, partly by yes. This, oh, definitely. <laughs> more, and more then, of course, the movies way. came after after the comic books, right? So. Mm hmm But uh, yeah. So it's I don't know. I don't have any notes on it, of course, because I'm just talking about it. But it's a very good film. Just more more emotional twisting than you would think at first sight. And then uh, I also watched The Artist. <laughs> Which is a oh, 2011 okay. film. Yes, they okay. had it on Netflix. So I was like, I would like to see a modern day silent film. And uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny because, Yifang, I know you saw my uh, Facebook story about there was a certain part in the movie. And I'm just like, this is boring. <laughs> it got better <laughs> after that. But um, wow. yeah, I don't know. For like the modern day silent film, I I didn't know what I expected. But. It is a good movie. <laughs> what was the name of the first movie you? The Man Who Laughs, nineteen twenty-eight. Okay. Other than Metropolis, I started watching The Toll of the Sea with Anime Wong. Uh, I did not. That is, I, I film I did not finish because my internet kept acting up because uh, my computer crashed at one point and then I never got back to it. <laughs> so, mm. using my new laptop as we speak. But I would like to finish that movie because uh, Diane talked about it in one of our previous podcasts as well. And I've been dying to see it. So those are my movies. How about you guys? <laughs> well, uh, just today I watched uh, State of the Union, which is a Tracy and Hepburn film by Frank Capra. Hmm. And, uh, oh, Capra's amazing. I mean, he's always uh, amazing. He's, he's one of my yeah. favorite directors for sure. Right. And uh, it, it, it co-stars uh, Van Johnson and Angela Lansbury. And, uh, you know, uh, Frank Capra is always political and it's about a man basically railroaded, connived into running for president and his relationship with his wife. So the, the cute thing about the movie is State of the Union is a dual. The title refers to State of the Union being that he's running for president his union with his wife at the same time. So it's, it, I like it. I like that movie a lot. So Harold Lloyd, uh, YouTube, if you go on YouTube channel and you search for uh, Harold Lloyd's official 
estate approved maybe not approved but harold lloyd who is he has a uh youtube channel that's pushing out like pretty unique um search for the channel called harold lloyd okay um okay. and uh the youtube channel uh and you subscribe to it it's publishing um uh, both full films as well as shorts of the harold lloyd's um uh, sort of his oeuvre of his entire filmography, not the whole thing, but a big chunk of it. I don't know if it is the whole thing, actually. I haven't really looked, but it's a big chunk of things that are largely unseen. And it's legitimate, too, because there's wow. it's wow. going around the circles in the uh, silent film private fan communities. And it's really significant. I mean, some of it is in HD, full <laughs> HD, wow. 1080. Some of it is... On YouTube, I'm surprised. Yeah, and also, like, yeah. never been seen. And it's just really... You know, Harold Lloyd's now because we did a review on safety last, and it was an incredible movie. I really liked liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. it, to me, it was almost basically like a perfect comedy, you know. And so, having access now, because that's the problem with his stuff, right? He, he held it so close to his chest that he died without really giving it um, to uh, a trustee or some group of people that would care for his uh films you know what i mean and basically after his uh widow wife died it basically got sold off in different places different people and entities and organizations owned the uh, rights to his films you know what i mean hmm. and so that's why it's really hard to get a hold of harold Lloyd movies because he he kind of he really wanted it to be shown in the movie theaters uh and in the 40s and 50s and 60s, when a lot of the cinema tried to play his movies, he really, like, I'm sorry, some of the TV studios, like when television first started arriving, television wanted to uh, get the rights of his films to be, you know, uh, played on TV, right? On reruns and whatever. And he refused. He really just wanted it to be in the cinemas, right? Right. I can see there's some pushback. Well, because he didn't want to play the game. He was just like, this deserves to be on the big screen. Mm -hmm. And that was his quality control. But unfortunately, he died before, you know, all of this modern, um, you know, streaming stuff we have these days. You know what I mean? So anyway, long story short, it's an incredible array of stuff in there. Some of which has basically never been seen or very rarely seen. How about that? So check it out. It's a bunch of stuff. I'm just looking at this real short list here. Uh, Kid Brother, Full Film, uh, Safety Last, The Freshman, Speedy, uh, and Under the Shorts, uh, Now or Never, From Hand to Mouth, Among Those Presents, Bumping to Broadway. Some of these are some of the largest, most popular things in in pristine, as pristine as you can. Um, anyways, check it out. He's definitely one of the greats, you know, right up there with the, the Chaplins, the Buster Keatons, except that both of those other artists have had their filmography basically out and about uh, accessible. How about that? If you were looking for it, you can access it. But Harold Lloyd for a very long time has not been, you couldn't access it. And so literally just dropped some of this a month ago, some of this four or five days ago, some of this just 11 hours ago. Yeah, like now and never just got published in 11 hours ago. So these are rare treasures, I think, for the new generation. I highly recommend. I I think I saw some of this. I can't remember now. But I know really I good. saw the freshman was on there. I think I actually saved it to my list because he's supposed yeah, to be a football yeah. player. And I... Yeah, go in the channel, subscribe to it, and just check out all this stuff that is being pushed out. It, it's quite amazing. And there's a there's a full documentary on there, and there's a uh, tracing the footsteps of for his filming of Speedy and on and on. There's a bunch of stuff on here. It's really cool. Um, as is related to silent films, so. <laughs> and I will be linking that in the show notes once I subscribe myself. Yes. <laughs> um, I've also been kind of uh, going through my Kurosawa, which is my one of my, if not my favorite director mm -hmm. um, of nice. all time. He is. Um, I think I've been. I was watching his filmography up through and up until I want to say. I can't remember something like either seven samurai or before that I'm kind of going through his filmography one by one. And I stopped somewhere in the middle somewhere and I can't 
remember now which one. I want to pick that back up and kind of take it home to completion. Mm. So, how did you like Seven list. Samurai? Oh, it's. I mean, I've seen it many times before. It's one of my favorites uh, of all times. I mean, it's just it's got. Everything. I love it too. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's nearly four hours long, so it's super long. Yeah, but, but it's a, really, it's a samurai flick. <laughs> well, it's not just that. I think it's it's a drama about sort of group of people coming together and and the thing about that movie that's it is so fascinating is that kurosawa himself was a fan of westerns so he was inspired by john ford in the westerns that's one of the reasons he made his own version of it in a kind mm-hmm. of japanese style samurai take of a western which of course if you know film history then magnificent seven was inspired by seven samurai which of course now remade recently, I think, in the last five to ten years. But Which anyways. I still haven't seen because I just don't have the courage. Because it's my favorite yeah. film of all time. <laughs> you're talking about Magnificent Seven or you're talking about Seven Yeah, that's Samurai? Magnificent Seven is my favorite movie of all time. Oh really? And like you mean the Western that was inspired by the, uh Seven the Samurai? Oh yeah, yeah. It's John yeah. Sturges. Yeah. It, yeah. But I don't know how much I'm going to hate the new one. With, oh, uh, yeah, just Denzel skip it. Right? Yeah, yeah, just skip it all together. Um, I would say then I munched a little bit on um, It's a Wonderful Life as well. Um, I had the 4K disc version and I just, I guess on a whim, played it. And it's like you said, um, Bob, for State of the Union, I didn't seen that movie. I haven't seen a lot of Capra stuff, but uh, wait, is this that Capra? Let me think. It is Capra. Yep. Right. It's a Wonderful Life. Right. I'm getting. Mm-hmm. I'm not getting it wrong. Yep. It's I, a Wonderful I don't always Life. Remember the details. Uh, Mr. Deeds goes to town. Exactly. Mr. Smith yeah. Goes to Washington. And him yeah. and Stewart really had had a good pairing. Uh, had a good run there. So. Yep. Well, Stewart worked with uh, um, the Master of Suspense as well. Uh, so yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, he worked with a lot of people, but his yeah, but I mean, contributions yeah. with uh, Capra were really great yeah like like you said it it wasn't just about one thing it was like about a whole slew of things right it was about the relationships it was about like especially like it's a wonderful life the parts i saw was about the small town banking and economics and it's just and class i just found mm-hmm. that incredibly fascinating that it's just inherently political and also just it talked about a variety of topics uh rather than just a few things you know it just it was really broad, you know, the, the topics are covered. Anyway, I like that movie. Which one did you see? Oh, It's a Wonderful Life. I saw a bit oh, and pieces of it. Yeah. yeah. That's a classic. I have to watch that every Christmas Eve. Yeah, it used to be on TV on Thanksgiving. Um, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. I also would recommend if you haven't seen it, uh, you can't take it with you. Oh, uh, I may have I've seen I've read that. the play. Yeah. yeah. I've either seen that or I've seen you can't uh, uh, you only live once. I always get those two titles confused. There's a bunch of movies in, in the black and white days of you can't something with you. <laughs> 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 so I always get a, a number of those titles confused. But I've seen a number of those, yeah. Yep. Um, you only live once also is a good movie too. I think that's also by Fritz Lang. Pretty sure. Uh, you can't take it you film. Let me double check. Could be wrong. <laughs> Can't take it with you. Oh, actually, this is by Capra. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that, that's, no, that's the one suggesting. you just said. That's the one you just said. Okay, let me see. I, I was thinking about, wait, wait, you only live once. That's that's what I was thinking about. Okay, so this one's by Fritz Lang. Okay, so, so you only live once, 1937. It's funny. The one you suggested was the one I was searching for. <laughs> I, was, I, I get easily confused. So my, what I was thinking in my brain while I was thinking about you only live once, right? Nowadays people yeah. use YOLO. But it's 1937. It's directed by Fritz Lang. Uh, Sylvia Sidney, Henry Fonda. It's considered an early noir. That's why I think like Fritz Lang is the father of noir because it really is mm. a lot of the elements of his early film, including Metropolis, has so much of like the nitty gritty darkness, femme fatale predecessors. It's kind of proto proto typical, like a prototype of noir before noir was even 
constitute as a genre, you know what I mean? But anyway, so it, it's an incredible movie, that one. You, you Only Live Once. Really, a lot of the uh, Fritz Lang's Hollywood efforts are really worth watching. But anyways. That brings us around to Metropolis. Exactly. It does indeed. It does <laughs> indeed. That's probably all I've seen. I could go on, but that's that's probably good enough. Um, so let's get into it. Um, I'm going to give you some backgrounds about Metropolis and then Actually, let me, before I get there, what do you guys know of Metropolis before you've, you've seen the movie? I mean, you've seen it before, right, Bob? I had seen it before, and mostly I remembered, I didn't remember the details of the story. I only remembered the visuals and the class struggle. You know, I saw it when I was pretty young, probably in my 20s or 30s, and and uh, sorry if I'm So many you, years ago, many, many young. years ago, right? <laughs> 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 Sorry, sorry, I'm laughing because I just called someone in their thirties young, and that, some people might like <laughs> not even thirties yet. <laughs> yep, anyway, yep. Um, I actually really lost my thought, but yeah, um, I, 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 the um, yeah, that's all I basically remember is the visuals, the artistry of it, and I, I liked it a lot when I saw it the first time. And but this time I watched it, I paid more attention to the storyline and. It's got much more to it than I than I thought. Hmm. Well, there's actually a lot more film to it than you watched originally. Anyways, it's oh, about know, thirty it's, more minutes on this cut. Yeah, it's two and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. And Lily, have you encountered this movie before, or, or at least what are your impressions of what you've heard about this movie before you watched it? Is this the first time you've seen it, by the way? It is. So I'm not 100% sure if I ever heard about it before we started this podcast. I had seen the posters for it just, you know, on the internet with the, the robot. They're kind but... of iconic, aren't they? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very unique. You know, you're you wonder what it's supposed to be about because what I expected it the film to be about wasn't what the poster told me if you know what I mean because most of them are just like a cityscape with the just the robot face in the center and you're just like okay what's right. going on but um and how you know the makeup for it's like insanely creepy especially so you're like what is this movie um I don't think I've heard of it before but i was uh i found this great article from roger ebert on his website about metropolis and there just so many movies were inspired by this film it's pretty crazy and i have seen some of them <laughs> just some but um like uh they mentioned blade runner the fifth element bride of frankenstein dr strange love like just so many things can be you know pieced back to this one movie from the 20s yeah. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So like Star many. Wars, The Matrix. It goes on and on mm -hmm. and on, right? Yeah. Thankfully. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I'm going to give you guys some background about it. Uh, not too long, but just a little bit. The it, film is uh, 1927, Metropolis. It's a German expressionistic science fiction drama directed by Fritz Lang. Fritz Lang, uh, for those who aren't familiar in the sound, I. I can't remember if we've. I I did look at the filmography for Fritz Lang, and I I gotta imagine I don't think we read any of it, which is shocking because he's one of the mm -mm. greatest directors, really, of all time. And but he's directed some really significant silent films of all time, and I'm just shocked that we we hadn't really dove into any of it. <laughs> There's but plenty that's okay. more to watch. <laughs> yeah, there's always an endless amount of things to watch. But he's uh, prior to Metropolis, he started working around 19, mid 1915, uh, 16s as primarily a, a writer of ideas and scenarist. Uh, but then he got into directing in 1918 with uh, Halblet and uh, on and on. But his pop most popular one is. The one that he gets started to get noticed for, uh, I would say, is like the Spider series. Um, and also there's like their Spiders Part 1, Part 2, The Golden Sea, The Diamond Ship, and then The Wandering Image. Um, uh, Destiny, is, then he, he really came into his own with Destiny and Dr. Mobusi, the gambler. It's huge characters, iconic. It's, Dr. Mobusi basically started 
to become a uh, kind of like a uh, iconic character of noir slash dark German expressionistic cinema from that time forward. I think his last film was also that he directed. It was called The Thousand Eyes of Dr. Mabusi. His very last film was about Dr. Mabusi still after all those years. Um, yeah, so uh, there's that. And then he also did uh, De, I'm not going to do the name justice, uh, Ne Blue Lungen, <laughs> kind of the mythic. Um, Kind of the Lord of the Rings, predecessor to Lord of the Rings mythology, essentially. Um, yeah, in two parts. So he got really famous with all of those titles I just mentioned. And that uh, that that's before he started Metropolis. So he's already a well-known entity in the German film industry as well as world cinema. And uh, so that that's just his career. And uh, he got inspired to do... Um, uh, Metropolis when he visited New York um, and he saw this giant you know if you if anybody's ever been to uh, New York City and you just kind of take a stroll down or any large metropolis really uh, city modern city it can get really overwhelming if you've never been into a large city I, I don't consider Boston a really large city because you can walk through it in like half an hour downtown but, uh, the food, we have two giant building things you're being sandwiched by two giant walls. Yeah, basically. But if you've been to like New York City, it, it, that's why they call it the urban jungle because um, once you walk through it, it's an endless uh, building after mm -hmm. you know skyscraper after skyscraper. You could literally walk hours, if not days on end. I don't even know how long. It would almost be near impossible to walk through the entire city on foot. You know, it, you would be dead tired. It's that large, and it's just like man-made structure. You, you can walk through the entire city and still be like exhausted, and not exhaust the city, you know. And that's the, I think, the feeling that he kept, he got. And even when he was visiting uh, New York City in the 1920s, probably like 1924, 1925, something like that. I mean, back then it wasn't built up. I don't even know if was Empire State Building even up. I don't even know, but. Regardless, uh, like, I don't know. even then, even then, there was a huge amount of buildings, and even then, it right. felt overwhelming. I can't even imagine if he were alive today, that that if he walked through a modern metropolis, what do you feel like? But it, you imagine though, you have to you're coming from essentially, you know, a, a place that doesn't have that uh, cityscape, you know, uh, a densely populated city with huge man-made structures like that. And I think so. He was so as he was walking through, that's where he got the idea of like, wow, what happened here? Like this, you know, mega structure, and and he started that really piqued his interest on in creating a film about um a massive city and what would happen with the class and who works up there, who works down there, and mm -hmm. and he started adding more ideas into his. Uh, but really, what's amazing isn't just him. What's amazing is that then wife, his then wife, uh, Thea von Harbo, was an amazing talent. I mean, if you, again, think about, um, you know, the modern representation of, you know, male, female sort of artists in at least mainstream uh, entertainment industry, it's still, you know, on the director front. Um, behind the camera, it was still largely male dominated, right? But back then, as we already discussed several times, pre 1920s it was half and half, if not more, that the females were really in power with a lot of things. And in this situation, in that time and space, um, uh, Fritz Lang's wife, uh, Thea von Bort, was just an amazing artist, you know, this is prior to her own what you know, uh, marriage to uh. To first line, she already had her own career of you know screenwriting, directing, and even acting. So she's been in a number of things, but she wrote a lot of stuff. You know, some with first line front, some with other people, and so she's done the the stuff like um, he worked with F. W. Murno and some of his films. Worked with uh, 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 Carl Dreyer. Worked with. Uh, all these artists, you know, came up with some of the ideas for Dr. Mabusi and on and on. So a lot of this concept for Metropolis also came from her, right? So they, they worked together to come up with the 
the scenario and story for Metropolis. You know what I mean? So that's mm -hmm. fascinating too, that it wasn't just a guy who came up with a science fiction story, one of the best science fiction stories and, and films of all time. It was really the idea and concept and fleshing out of it came from her, you know? She would often write a novel uh, of the screenplay that she just worked on, except for this one. She didn't write the novel uh, for this particular movie. But I mean, think about it. Uh, how great of a writer you have to be that you just, oh, I think I'll just turn this into a novel too. <laughs> And she would often time the novel to get published at the same time when the movie comes out, you know? So she's that talented, you know? So uh, very well-known entities, um, basically kind of the royalties of German expressionistic film industry uh, as it comes into the making of this film. And uh, that's kind of a little bit background of the artists who, who are creating this. Obviously, there's a lot more like the, the set designers and the, various different people and effects and you know obviously it takes a team it's not just one person but however in the stars and all that good stuff and and this is of course produced in the famous uh ufa which is the universal film it's kind of the german film industry's primary studio you know that's been turning out many film uh great films uh free nazi germany basically and so that's kind of that brings us to the making of the the film itself, and of course, it took you know, filming takes place from nineteen twenty uh, twenty five to twenty six, um, over seventeen months at this amazing cost. Um, it's one of the most expensive um, endeavors uh, of all time. So, hmm. so it's about um, what did they convert it to? Uh, thirty-eight million in twenty-seven ten uh twenty seventeen dollars. Uh, for, for then is a long is a lot of money, you know. Because a lot of films back then didn't require this amount amount of money, but you saw it on screen, you know. A lot of mm. the effects and a lot of the things were very much on the screen itself. Um, when it first came out, it was really mixed. Uh, even uh, an amazed, very famous uh, science fiction author like H.G. Wells described it as silly. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I read that article too. He yeah. was like, "What?" He because he he compared it to one of his books that had been written exactly. a few years yeah. before. Uh, right. I didn't write down which book it was, but he was just like, "What the heck?" <laughs> Of course, he's biased because he did write some of the best science fiction of all time. Mm -hmm. So, if compared to what he's written and he's tasted you know it's not going to compare but that's the books you know he, some of those artists don't understand the film medium as well you know as a new medium remember this is still pretty new it's only two two decades or so or less um so anyways it, it, the cut of the movie um after it debuted in just german premiere a large portion of the original uh first lines original footage was removed and the reason is because it, it was just so long and it, due to the criticism, the mixed criticism, it came in. It's just like, uh, I, you know, they, they really wanted to chop it down for marketing purposes to, so it can sell better. And there's been many attempts uh, since that time, even by the 70s and 80s, to try to restore it. And there's a long history of that, which I'm not going to go into here. You can read about it in the Wikipedia. But I just wanted to bring you to the latest, the final restoration that I'm a, that we're uh, aware of today currently. So based on all that they understand that the notes that they have, uh, there is a, a roughly something like uh, 153 minutes, the original runtime. The cut that has been available uh, to most audiences is either the, there's been a 90 minute cut. And then in around the year 2000, there's been a two hour cut, you know, 120 something minute cut. So that's been sort of mainstay of how you can watch and access Metropolis and experience it for a really long time, both since the, the 1980s, the 90 minute version roughly, as well as the 2001 edit um, that it was about two hours or 124 minutes long. Now in 2008 in Argentina, um, uh, there is a museum um, that uh, had a backup copy of because they make a backup print in case the original, you know, uh, is gone in a fire or something like that. 
so that's what happened was um in uh you know in in uh Buenos Aires they found it yeah exactly in the, what's called the Museo del Cine and uh and the negative is a uh just a backup copy, right? As I was saying, of the 35 millimeter original. And distributor was just to make sure it doesn't, like the nitrate doesn't, it's, as we know, it's very flammable. So you should mm -hmm. make sure that it doesn't uh, explode and catch fire. So they have a backup print in 16 millimeter of the original, um, maybe not the original 153 minute cut, but as much of it as possible, I think. And so when they discovered it, um, the print was investigated by this, uh, I guess, a collector, film historian, TV personality, uh, Fernando Pena, and also uh, Paula Felix Didier, the head of the museum. Both of them basically was like, wow, that's incredible. Like, they, they found this stuff and then working with uh, the um, Germans, uh, FWMS, the entity that restores films, the classic German films, they basically restored it back. And along with, they also found additional prints in 05 of missing scenes. Anyways, the, the long and net sum of it is that they restored it in 2010 and it premiered in, in February 2010 uh, in Berlin and other places. So that's kind of the, um, that's how we're getting the 148 minute cut, which is nearly two and a half. It's not full 100, uh, 153 minutes. There's about uh seven minutes still missing but probably footage just beyond repair or just different things that where you know, when you was this it. last when was the version we watched released the version we watched it was released in 2010. so oh, gotcha. that's the final complete uh, metropolis as complete as you can you can get basically and that one's 140 minutes 48 minutes that's why it's two and a half hours long gotcha mm. so so that's the history of basically bringing up to speed on the print that we watched, which was released uh, everywhere as Kino and everywhere, you know, every, Master of Cinema, Eureka, Entertainment Distributor, and it's everywhere. Um, what was interesting to me was that I saw, I, around that same time when this all this stuff was happening, about a year later, maybe in 2011, they uh, released one locally here in Boston at the Coolidge Corner Cinema. They had a film print, but they also had... Uh, Alloy Orchestra, which is like a silent film accompaniment oh. uh, orchestra, and they wrote an original score for it. So they wow. decided for this showing, they didn't want to go with the original film score, but they just like wrote all original. And they've been doing it for a long time, but certainly Metropolis is huge for them. They really liked it, right? And so they wrote original score. It's a modern take, right? They're modern artists. They used to be in like 80s, 90s bands, and they use their artistry to create a modern score for this movie. And that's kind of what they do, I think. They go around the country touring and uh, do film accompaniments of original scores that they wrote in current time, modern times, using modern stuff for those silent films. But this is one of the movies that they've been doing. But I was there live. I saw them perform live in Brookline. They're based out of Brookline anyways which uh, is where Coolidge Corner Theater is. So between the complete cut and between the original film score, I was like blown away, right? It's an experience. I really wished we were almost going to see it about a year ago in April because they were going to do another showing of Metropolis with them, the Allo Orchestra, because they're local, right? They're going to actually perform Beverly, but unfortunately the pandemic got to us. <laughs> Sad oh, day. It's still here. Sad day. Yeah. yeah. So maybe one day, uh, post pandemic, when it's around, I'll send you guys a notification. If it ever comes back, you should really experience this in person. It's really amazing. It's like a concert feeling. Anyways, so that really made an impression on me. I really enjoyed it, and that's why I've been saying all along that silent films really are like concerts. It's so hard to watch it at home with a non live orchestra to perform it. You know, mm -hmm. it's also on a large screen, of course, and um. Anyway, so so that brings us to today. Um, uh, you know, one of my favorite films, certainly of all time, regardless of silent, its contribution to cinema is, you know, tremendous and gigantic. And obviously we just talked about is that Roger Ebert article and all the things we talked about before. Highly influential uh, across many other subsequent films. And um, 
just you know it, inspirational right uh, on many many fronts um having given all of that background <laughs> let's go with uh lily what you what do you think then now that you've seen it with the uh, that score by the way was the all orchestra score and by, oh, one really? more last huh. note, yeah, so one more last note is that originally that score was supposed to be included in the kino like uh blu-ray or dvd release but at the last minute decided to pull funding for it because they really wanted to go with the original i don't know if the uh, uh fritz lang estate was still on i don't know if they have power but whatever the decision was they were like we're just gonna do the original score we're not gonna use this modern take because they want to be more conservative they don't want to like make film fans mad i think a lot of silent film artists uh silent film fans they really like the original scores they prefer that i think generally um so that's why they 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 pulled this out at the last minute and didn't belong it's not part of any home release but you can buy it. that's what i did i bought the mp3 because they uh they that's how they sell it um on a cd so you can still buy it today just search for all orchestra you can buy the complete uh, score you just have to kind of sync it up yourself you know play it at the right time <laughs> mm. which is which is a little bit tricky but um what do you think oh well knowing that uh that's very interesting because i uh well I, I thought it was funny at the very you know listening to the score it the music to me reminded me of the the game the legend of zelda <laughs> I've never really played it, but when I was in college, my roommates would play it like the original game with like the with 2D animation. It was just the music was just that's what it reminded me of. So knowing that the Fritz Lang, you know, their the community wanted to keep the score original, I would love to hear what the Alley Orchestra had it go. It wasn't terrible music, don't get me wrong, but I was just I I had already assumed like they. It was remade, and knowing that is original just to me is kind of funky. But at the same time, the whole movie is so funky. I was just writing, uh, you know, thinking of what I want to say on Anchor for this film. You know, it's a tantalizing sci-fi wonder. <laughs> you know, it's got incredible choreography, and it just wanders throughout this whole thing, and it's just such a spectacle. It, it's, you know, I was thinking to myself while watching it, um, I did take a nap in between because I wasn't feeling too good. <laughs> but even though it's two and a half hours, uh, I could probably if I wasn't feeling so tired at the time, I probably would have sat through the whole thing and not complained at all. You know, it didn't feel super long, even though it was long. At some points, it did. You know, but it it's just such a crazy movie to, you know, from not knowing what it was originally about. And actually experiencing it, I'm just like, oh my god, this is like has so much. There's so much to it, you know. Just you know, character develop. I guess you could say there's some character development. Maybe there's not. Honestly, there is with Fredder, the lead. But uh, I was like losing it with uh, Maria's act, the actress Brigitte Helm. Just between her going from her gentle safe self to being so erratic as the fembot <laughs> as i wrote in my notes that was just such good acting like mm -hmm. you know it's the same person but i'm thinking to myself holy cow <laughs> yep. just such a striking difference and uh yeah. i think it made the film even more just that much captivating um there's a lot to say about Metropolis. Hands down, I'd watch it again. I, If we can watch it, if I can go with you guys next year, <laughs> I will definitely watch it again with the live orchestra. <laughs> yeah, she was only 18, by the way. She was 18? Oh, my yep. God. Yeah. I'm freaking out. <laughs> I'm freaking out over here. Oh, man. Yeah, it was yeah. just... I mean, you knew she was young, because even at the first time... They introduce her to the character. Oh, I was dying over the clarity of her. Uh, what did I write? Uh, just like, well, her introduction shot. Just the clarity on her face was so pretty. I was just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> you know, you think of filmmaking now and you get these beautiful shots with lighting and cinematography. That was in black and white. And she still looked beautiful. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> no wonder yeah. Fredder was like, ah. Oh. But, um. I did not know that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, 
what else can I say about this? I mean, I have a ton of notes that I took from Ebert's list, but you yeah, know, I just go to Bob about... and we're gonna yeah. circle back. So, Bob, what do you think? What did you think, Bob? I liked it. I liked the story quite a bit. I mean, I, I learned. What, what was it. different between this time and the and now many years later that you've seen it? <laughs> well. The first time I didn't get the whole story, I was more intrigued with just the um, the visuals and the basic storyline. I mean, I followed. Which are still focusing... astonishing, right? What? Which are still astonishing, right? Even today. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, yeah. Um, you know, um, at first, when I started watching it, I thought this guy, well, like I said, I was focused on the class struggle mostly when I saw it the first time early on in my life. And I thought it showed that artistically very nicely. Um, maybe when I watched it, I don't think I watched it. The first time I saw it, I'm pretty sure I didn't have any English subtitles. So I think I watched it purely as a silent film. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they had the German, you know, cards um but I, I couldn't read them so i didn't worry about it i just took what i could from the visuals and um and i do remember i liked it i liked the big machine and when i saw this one i paid much more attention to the story the father son aspect um that he was uh Realizing things about, I mean, I agree with Lily totally that I think that for, for, uh, Freighter um, had a had a real character development in it. Um, his eyes were open to exactly who his father really was. You know, disconcerned about the the lower classes, they're where they belong, as he said. And um, that aspect of the movie is, you know, is touching to me. You know, it's touching to me that that the son does it now sees his father in a different light. You know, um, I guess the music was the hardest thing for me to take. Actually, I loved it. I thought it was well done, but it was like two and a half hours of the same piece, and I was it was droning. It was kind of numbing my brain after mm -hmm. a while. Um, so, good piece, but I thought it was overused. Um, almost constantly, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I I think they're using the modern sort of John Williams late motif concept for like mm -hmm. a silent film, which is weird because they didn't really do that as much compared to today. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, other than that, the visuals. I mean, I think the most there were several, of course, very spectacular things. But I remember very. All inspiring, imagination inspiring, and I again, as you watch silent films, you have to put yourself in the eyes of the era. And um, the the cityscape scene where the planes were flying around and the cars were all driving, and I was thinking to myself, this is 1927, you know, cars aren't actually terribly old at that point, and of course they had, like you said, the big city. There weren't that many of them, like really big cities, and so to blow that up and to exaggerate it to the point of this is the future, this is where cities are going. It wasn't a, a huge leap in imagination to, to see that, but to see it on screen and imagine this is an audience in 1927, seeing this would be like, oh, wow, you know, this is a crazy place, you know, with planes flying through the city. Like, um, I remember that scene being very striking to me. I was like, wow, I like this. You know, and yeah, it does remind me of a lot of more modern films, things like um, Conspiracy, not, no, um, what was the one with Tom Cruise where uh, Minority, Minority Report. Report. Yeah. I thought the cityscape scene in that looked just like it was taken from this, like inspired by this, where the cars would go on rails and, and you know. Yeah. So anyway, um, all, all in all, I liked it a lot. I mean. I definitely think it's worth watching. Yeah. Mm. Wait, yeah you mentioned... Go ahead, Lily. 
Oh man, it's so hard with this not seeing each other part. No, I was just gonna say, like, I agree with you, Bob, with the cars. I mean, I thinking then to now, I was like, how would they know like so many? I mean, they wouldn't know, but just having that concept of how many cars are on the road then for the big city, you know, that's exactly how it is on the 405 out in California. <laughs> it's bumper to bumper. <laughs> exactly. Um, I don't know. I think just I'm not saying they saw into the future or anything, but it's it's neat when movies can take those little details of life and kind of throw them in to see how it might affect, you know, the future. But I don't, I don't know. I just I'm agreeing with your point of like, I thought about that while watching this film. I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, it's just different. But that's just all I wanted to add. Yeah, I imagine. Um... If you are watching, see the thing about the experience is that if you have, and you know, I'm still watching this as big as a 100 inch projector, right? Like a screen, and it's pretty big, but I still remember my screening in, you know, a, you know, 25 foot or 50 foot, you know, gigantic screen of the cityscape, you know what I mean? I mean, that's like overwhelming, you know, your entire field of vision is encapsulated, and I think. Uh, seeing this on the large scale cinema uh, is like it, it, like a modern, you know, action piece, you know, like you would just watch like a Transformers, not comparing both. I'm just saying the scale and scope of it, right, of the movie, when you can watch it in the theater on such a large scale and size, I think really makes a huge impact, right? Because oh, absolutely, it's mm -hmm. the spectacle of it. That's what makes me yeah, going to the movie absolutely. so wonderful. Yeah, and, a big and, screen, as they say. Right, and so you, <laughs> when you do that, and even the, uh, my smaller quote unquote scale, 100 inch, it's still like, it's so impressive to watch that cityscape scenes as well as any of the number of the, uh, the grandeur, you know, of cinema. Um, but you know, the technical, I think, side of this movie is really, um, I think the the primary talent it's not the only but i think it's the richest aspect and component of films like this and what fritch lang brings really well to the table both his films before this one as well as the films afterwards he's really good in the from a technical perspective right like even movies of that time it's really hard to find movies where they cut and juxtapose different themes the concepts of like the higher and the lower levels mm. uh to represent the classes but also like there are many scenes in here um i can uh think of one scene where okay so remember there's a scene um that um bridget helms character when she was trapped by the mad scientist the doctor and he was trying to grab her and she held on to the bars of the ceiling or something remember right and mm -hmm. she was trying to get yeah. out right she was screaming and her screens were heard by uh, the Fremer character, Fremer. right? Right, and so Fremer, like, yeah. So when he heard it, right, the sun, and he was walking. Right? Of course, he happened to walk by, right? <laughs> but he, <laughs> yeah, he heard it, right? Boy. Right, right. So he once he heard it, though, do you remember there was one specific shot where his eyeballs were searching for where that sound came from, and then there's a camera angle panning, like left and right frantically at the building, right? Of where the mad scientist was. Remember that there was one specific shot. It's probably very minor, but that's like a film technique that is something like a modern movie would do. But he was right. doing it in like 1927, which of course, you know, you, you, I think we keep forgetting that by then, that's the final one or two years of silent film era. Like uh, only a few more years. That's it. There's no more. The industry was going to go through this large conversion to largely sound and talkies, right? Mm. And this is the final sort of thesis or capstones of films that are going to be released that by this time, they should be pretty mature and that they've done so many techniques up to that point. So it shouldn't be a surprise, but I still am all the time because of how, like, how great those techniques are and how some of those techniques are still in use today, right? Of like, you know, like when he heard the sound of somebody screaming, the camera would take his point of view, uh, a POV perspective and say, where is she, where is she? And the camera would pan left and right and look at the building where that 
sound was coming from. You know what I mean? Right. Mm. Like that technique and that technical level literally places yourself inside of the character. You know, if mm -hmm. you have those. I don't even know what they're called. Like, their cameras mounted on the actor or the chest, and they're looking at the actor as they're running, right? Oh, it's right. a type of steady cam, but it's a, right. it is a specific type of camera. Uh, yeah. It's not body cam. I think it does, it's what, a, yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, but you know what I mean? There's so mm -hmm. much, there's so much more technology today that can put you into the perspective of the characters now. But even then, mm -hmm. like, they were already doing so much of that. In 1927, right? Yes, it's astonishing. Mm. And so I think the technical sort of um, wizardry that you know, for Science Pictures, have is amazing. Or even like when that machine, the heart of the machine, or whatever it's called, exploded, and all the mm -hmm. workers like, like were thrown out of. <laughs> they were like thrown from the second or third story level, you know? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I saw one and, go flying. <laughs> yeah, there was a bunch of people that went flying. And how they did that, just like one little scene, just a few seconds. Must have been on ropes because the arms and legs were moving and they were they were actual guys. So I was like, Right, but or some of the some of the uh plates were probably uh uh overexposed or something like they were melted one on top of the other, you know, they're dissolved one right. to another. It seemed like there was a shadow of an, a person just you know, totally not in the same frame or same uh, footage. You know what I mean? And of course, it turns into Moloch, right? I love that the, there's some imagery. See, it's not, you know, as you were saying, Bob, the, the themes of class is certainly very strong, right? In, in, in one aspect of this film. But then above and beyond that, there's, he seems to be imbuing this with so much more than just class. I think there are these father and son stories, but also yeah, there's this religious up. element. There's also a little bit of this religious element of like, uh, oh, absolutely. The, the heart of the machine, right, is Moloch, right? Moloch being, of course, one of the ancient thing gods where you, you worship him, you, it's human sacrifice. You throw humans into fire, burn them as an uh, act of worship, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And there's a literal scene in here. Where, yeah, and the literal scene of like the machine turning into the mouth of Moloch with the two. That was, like, yeah, Freighter's vision of it is he saw it as a machine. Exactly. That people, yeah. Exactly. So it's like it's like it wasn't uh, implicit, and nor was it like subtle at all, right? It was like beating your head over with it. Also, later on, of course, the Tower of Babel, right, and the whole the biblical notion of it. Of course, of course, you know it it does strip out the 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 God element. I think it's strictly from a humanistic perspective, because if you look at the scriptures quoting, it's just taking like the specific man and what man is it actually doesn't go into the place of like compared to what the whole point of the scripture which is like oh well you know they'll become godlike you know if they try to build this meaning like they're trying to be gods themselves right it doesn't really quite go to that level it just says man when he's kind of full of himself his pride will kind of get in the way of his own successes and failures and stuff like that you know it it takes a very it, it's a very limited filtered humanistic view right it doesn't actually go all the way there you know what i mean and even in the revelation 17 quote when um they talk about they discuss the horror of babylon mm -hmm. there's a scene towards the end with the robots dancing like crazy right We're stirring the man into lust and stuff like that well that's like the it's the same imagery of the, the horror of babylon which they quote it from in, when they're in the uh was it the catacomb or was it somewhere else? I can't remember which part now, but. I know. It kind of did blend together. Yeah. What what are talking about? So, the, so they do reference sort of the, uh, the whore of Babylon, right? In, in Revelation times and how like that's supposed to, you know. Sort of make make people. Um, I don't know I, I think there's a link between like the technology of the robot and that religious callback into the apocalyptic. Like it, the, the way, fact it that it's is, a corrupting factor in society. Exactly. Yeah. It, so class is one element, but I think it leads into a larger discussion of like 
the apocalyptic nature of the society. If some of these uh, injustices of class struggles are not dealt with, it can lead to apocalyptic <laughs> mm -hmm. end of the world scenarios. I think that's what it's, you know, uh, I think detailing, right? It's important with it, not just like, okay, on the surface, there's this obviously this literal high class where you're in the clouds, literally living in the clouds, right? And then also the class is underneath the, the ground sort of working uh, to to help make the people above happy, you know, basically the workers, you know. So there's that one element. But when there's an imbalance, of course, the whole theme of the movie is what? The uh, the mind and the heart or something? The, the last... The hand connects the heart, or the it's the <laughs> hand and the I know the hand and the head and the heart. The head and the, and the hand need to be connected by the heart. By the heart, right? And they were like sappy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, I think the notion is this: that is that if the what the hand, which is the worker, and the the head, which is the the manager, is up top, if they're not in balance, then it's going to cause apocalyptic uh, things to happen, right? Mm -hmm. That's why the, the water is flooding, and that's why there's it like the whole thing is collapsed and destroyed, you know? Yeah. When there's an imbalance, right? Yeah. So, so I think those are some of the additional themes above and beyond just like uh, a simple class struggle. There is also those elements of like when those things are in balance, and of course, you know, you got the whole like children is caught in between and all that stuff. There's more drama behind it. Um, what do you guys think of? There's a character in here called the Thin Man. Have you heard of this before? I loved him. I loved him. Now, you know that there's another work uh, of Hamill or something, Hammett, uh, I forgot his name. He wrote a novel and eventually a movie called uh, The Thin Man. There's a movie series called, in 1934. Right, The Thin Man, yeah. Right, it's unrelated to this then, man. Right, because oh, that's that, funny. Yeah, that one is more of a detective or something like that, right? Eventually. Right, they're unrelated, right? They they are unrelated, but I that's love how the thought. notion. Okay. But the, how I love how the notion of that character is in here. Now I don't know for sure because I, I wasn't there, and I don't. In my googling, it doesn't seem like there is a connection. But I'm just wondering out loud if there is because if this movie came out and it's super popular, you wonder if that author. Was thinking at least about like like the thin man, right? <laughs> there's no there's, there's no there's no there's no, uh, uh, there's no similarity at all between the two characters. So oh, there isn't. No, I understand that there isn't. But uh, the the notion that the, the the thin man is like a detective like character. He's following the the sun, right? Yeah, that's true. That's right. That, so that there is an element of a dark sort of noirish thing. That's why I said. Fritz Lang is the grandfather of Noir, because even in such a small little area, it potentially could be inspiring that. But anyway, that's a little side yeah. note. But I love that character in this movie, though. He's very... I did, too. He was very vampirish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like a, a, when a, a something that moves, uh, hits against an immovable force, you know? Like, he's just like, you know, you can't, you can't move him, you can't touch him, you know? Yeah, he's something as, as the guy in the car couldn't break his grip. You know? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's an, he, he's so he reminds me a little bit like the the concept of the Joker, right? Meaning in the sense that he's a, a, he's just a force of nature. Yeah, right? he's a concept. He's not even like a real person. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But yeah. he's sinister and he's great. The guy's like, get out, get out! I tell you, and he sits casually sits yeah, down. He's he's a, like, like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to do my thing. <laughs> yeah. No, I liked him a lot. I thought he was great. Yeah. Fritz Rasp is the actor's name. Yeah. Well, what did you guys uh, think of the, the, um, the, uh, um, John Fritter's wife or, well, I guess his widow, the deceased wife and, and the son's mother. Like what, do you know what the, the behind the what? story behind him? Or her, rather, in, in the Mad Scientist. I don't even, I didn't even realize that part of the movie at all. So yeah, she's, it, she's, yeah. she basically has been immortalized. Does, you know there's a giant head of hell, H-E-L? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that was the dead wife's name. Now, the backstory, and oh, this is, right. I only know this because I read it, but 
it doesn't really explicitly spell out in the film, but essentially what happened was the mad scientist guy, right? The guy who created the robot, he is right. in love with the hell, the, the girl, the Which woman, way? who ran away and got married with John Fritter. So he's always been jealous and didn't like John Fritter, the, the, the father guy, right? That's why he brought him to bring them both down. Yeah, and that's why he said, like, that's why he said this, like, when he was, when he opened the curtain and there's a, 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 a statue, basically, to, uh, to H-E-L, right? That's, that's the wife, that's the, there's a, uh, the thing on that, and that's why he said, clearly. yeah, and that's why he said, uh, what, what did she say? She said, um, this is mine, like, don't take it away from me, because that shrine, or that concept of, uh, and the mother died giving birth to the son, right? And so there's there's father and son tension right there, right? But anyway, long story short is that she, like, he wasn't, the mad scientist was in love with her, and she ran away to be with him. And, of course, now the mad scientist is, like, jealous. Is like, hey, that, that thing like, that yeah. I'm looking behind the curtain is mine. Like, you took, you've already That's taken true. her away in real life. Don't take her uh, image of her away from me, you know what I mean? Right. Oh, no, 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 the man scientist guy. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to back up a little bit on the on my previous comment about how much I liked the father son aspect of the film, but I didn't really explain for the sake of our listeners that um, the father, uh, Johan, is the designer of the city itself, right. and all the machines and laborers below the city basically work in fear of this man. Um, and then the son, you know, who makes the discovery of these workers and confronts his father and finds that his father's very cold towards them and says, well, they're where they belong. <laughs> um, I just wanted to explain that for the listeners today's sake, that this relationship for me is, is very central to the movie. Well, I think explaining that piece um, that you're just explaining, I think explains some of that relationship because if you think about it, uh, you know, the fact that she died giving birth to him, his son, I mean, obviously he would love his son, but also there's this coldness right, from the father to the son yeah. because it's like you caused my wife to die. Exactly. You know what I mean? In the beginning of the movie is very cold, very right. stoic. Right, so I think some of that, not all of it, but I think there's an element of that that comes from that background story, which is, I think, is the reason why I wanted to explain it more so people understand as they're watching the movie that that's why there's some coldness in there because mm -hmm. it's that whole background story of, you know, she that's died giving birth to the child. Yeah. I wish, they, also, I wish they had explained that a little more clearly and a little less know, artistically. It's, because yeah, artistically, yeah. you think, what is hell? Hell seems like a like this mythical satanic god, you know? Like, right. what what is this? You know? Well, I yeah. mean, it is in the plaque though. It's it's uh, if you read the you know that big head, giant head, it says hell, born to me, uh, born to bring me happiness and a benediction to all mankind, which is the mad scientist sort of homage to her because he loves her, right? Yeah. But then it says I lost, that, but it didn't lost make to sense John, to me. lost to John Frederson, which is the the, the architect guy died giving life to Federer. Um, yeah, it was that, like incredibly detailed to be like, this is the reason yeah. why. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so you it's get there. over it. Yeah. yeah it is. Yeah, in John there, yeah, you don't. Yeah. yeah, you might not. So that part, we know is the life. By me. Yeah, but yeah. it doesn't, it still doesn't explain their, it doesn't explicitly tell you that uh, he loves her. You just have to read into the fact that. This, this mad scientist built an altar to her essentially with a large head, right? So, I, I don't so know how you say his name, Rotwang? Yeah, Rotwang, yeah. So he, he built an altar to her and covered the curtain and say, hey, get out of here. This is my stuff. You already took her right. away. So you have to like read into his uh, acting. You really have to read into his uh, silent film acting to get the fact that, yeah. you know, there's, there's a huge bitterness. Uh, yeah. Uh, between him and in, 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 and that's why I think when you know how in the section in the cave, in the catacomb rather, and they went down the catacomb to observe uh, Maria, talking about the ba Tower of Babel. But his son's down there. At some point, he blocks the the hole. Do you remember? 
he knows that John's son is down there, but he prevent he tells John to go up. It's like, hey, you're done here, go back up in the cave, right? He says, All right, see you later. But he knows the mad scientist knows that his uh John's son is down there, right? And so mm -hmm. he prevents him from seeing his son is down there. Uh and of course, you know, he's gonna be like, I'm gonna replace this girl, Maria, with a robot so that uh, you know, she will cause the downfall of the workers and distrust and all that stuff. And and, and his son. Mm -hmm. But also on another level, the robot, of course, is an image of the wife, right? Or and or the mother. Now there's an edible complex. Because of course, you know, John Fred the the, the son is in love with the girl, right? But now the girl is replaced by the robot. The robot is an image of the mother. Mm. <laughs> you see how there's an Oedipal complex, right? Oedipus, mm. yeah. I do yeah. now. Yeah. So that's why it's so Weird. rich. Right? There's, it's a really rich element of the story that isn't always like on the surface, right? Yes. Yeah, and I think the complete cut adds a lot of those additional elements. You guys can tell when the additional footage is added, right? You can tell when the extra footage is in. Because it was the streaky lines, right? Yeah, it's really yeah. scratchy, yeah. really bad quality. That's a, as good as it gets. I see. So you can tell when the additional, and they're usually just very character-driven uh, reactions, I think, reactionary shots. They're trying to slim down the, the time so they can show more of the movie, right? Back in the day, that's why they cut it out. Mm. Yeah. Let's see. You know, the, the guy, uh, World Twang, he, Twang, I don't know how you say that, but what one? he, uh, what is it? I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I'm just making it up. <laughs> you just have oh. to sound confident. <laughs> if, you, if you sound confident, that's the way it's pronounced. What one? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Run, run. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, I was thinking Rotwal, like, sure, but sure. anyway, be confident. Um, That's all that matters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I thought he was. I thought I just wanted to give him kudos for doing a really good math scientist. Oh yeah, maybe one of the original math scientists. I didn't even know other math scientist roles before this. I can't remember. Mm. I guess maybe Doctor Jekyll, Doctor uh, Mister Jekyll, and Doctor Hyde. Yeah, that maybe came out a few years too. before this one. Yeah, I noticed a classic scene in it, which I thought might be the first time it was it was seen in a film. I don't know, but the broom of doors, which was used in many other films, where you walk in and you see all these doors, and you don't know which one's the right door. Oh right, yeah. And what was interesting is it was a magical quality to the mad scientist's labyrinth because the doors would close behind them with like magically. <laughs> right, I, I think, I think that it's not just purely scientific. I think there's also a, um, I forgot the word they use often. Mysticism, I think, is the is the word. But yeah. there's a lot of uh, supernatural, yeah, uh, mysticism. Like because back then, they, um, he the had a pentagram on his door of his house, exactly. which tells you a lot. Right, but not only that, I feel like back in the old times, even around that era and before, uh, the whole notion of like alchemy and magic and mm. science were mm -hmm. one. Like there wasn't a separation now of like, oh, if you you know believe in like you know dark witchery magic that's fake and science is real. I think back in the day, um, probably earlier than this, but like earlier than the twenties and, and before that. There's a whole notion where all of that was the same. Like you would go to this right. quote unquote witch doctor. That's one of the reasons why the name stuck because it was all the same. Like how you got cured was also how you got the same love potion. Like it was the same person handling magical stuff because mm -hmm. healing was like magical, right? Like that's the whole notion of like science when it advanced enough appears to be magic, right? Yep. And I, th I think like even back then they still stuck to some of that and that's why that scientist with the door closing as well as animating that robot right there's mm, a of element, course. there's a mystic element to that above and beyond the science there yes there is some science fiction element but i think there's a layer of like mysticism in classic yeah. science fiction that doesn't really exist in modern science fiction you know what i mean 
Yes, totally. So. I mean, when you see the transformation of the robot into the girl, I mean, it's just like, okay, we're just going to say this happens. You know, like with, the, with the electrodes and everything going like, yeah, it's, it's like Frankenstein's magic. monster. Yeah, it's a lot more magic than science fiction, you know, a lot yeah. more fantastic and, and fantasy related. Yeah. So, in fact, it's similar to Gollum, right? We never reviewed that, but there's a movie called Gollum where they, you know, made a monster out of mud or something, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, the Jewish you know, the scene, the table, yeah. I actually wondered, it had me really curious if. If if he if it I didn't know if it was going to go in this direction, but I I feared that he was going to take the skin off the girl and put it on the monster, and I was like, "Ooh, this is pretty <laughs> creepy." I thought she That's was going to straight up just die because I thought he was putting it into her, too. and then yeah. I figured it was still going to be the Robo Lady, but it it was her. I was like, "What? Okay, that's different." Yeah, <laughs> that had me in suspense. I thought, "Oh, she's going to die," you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah, nope, nope. Just, and then just they just a copy. Have tea and conversations in her dungeon room i was yeah. and that's another thing that's like you don't expect her to be in the room sitting with rotwang and uh she's kind of crying over what's been happening to her um persona and i was you know what i mean that first initial take where she's there you're like wait she lived because <laughs> yeah. I, I certainly as the viewer i did not expect her to live because they show her like fainting in the chamber or like right, when she's lying down, they show her like her head goes to the side with her eyes closed. And yeah. you think, oh, she died. Yeah, she did. <laughs> There's another the other element of uh, the fantasism. I think the fantasy or mysticism, I think, has to do with a lot of the visions that the son gets. Right, not just the Moloch vision, but also like. When he's uh, he passes out a lot, first of all, so for some weird reason. <laughs> But when he does, and he sort of comes to when he's on his, uh, when he's ill on his bed or something, and he thinks that the thin man is like a priest, right? And that's where the whole Tower of Babel uh, comes in. He he basically quotes Revelation 17, you know? And remember there's a scene where the statues of the church that he was with the death, the scythe, and uh, the seven deadly sins. Yeah, the uh, seven deadly sins, yeah. The statues mm -hmm. come alive, and they're, you know. So it's like a vision of the future, right? It's a lot more fantastic yeah. and a lot more mystic, I think, than um, yeah, than just you know. You know, what I thought was really kind of odd was that the machine man was clearly a, a woman. <laughs> right, right. I think they kept using that term, and I was like, it well, wasn't even the. You know, it didn't even look like a man. It was like I think a woman. That might just be more of a, a translation thing because it's probably uh, something more like human machine rather than man, man as in a species. Man, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, I kinda I kinda thought that, but it was still kind of felt weird. <laughs> yeah, it must but be yeah, it, it is coming from German into English, so Yeah, that's my guess. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, there's, uh, I feel like with this movie, there's uh, yeah, almost a uh, limitless amount of things to talk about. You could take one topic and you keep going on and on and on. You took some notes on the um, article yes. that you wrote Well, I, I didn't exactly take notes, but I did take pieces from what he wrote. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, well, he talks, you know, it talks about, like, how... Like, kind of what we were saying about Metropolis itself, you know, Link story is broad, to put it my, mildly, but the storytelling in this film is mostly visual because, you know, everything that's happening, you have these, like you said, big spectacles, like with uh, the robot Maria and her, you know, doing her lusty dance. And then eventually it, she becomes like the monster of Babylon from the book, so to say, and just stuff like that. Um you know, just talking about, like, he kind of called, like, the heavenly side of Metropolis, like, that type of pleasure garden where we first meet Fredder, and then, obviously, the very bottom, the bowels of hell, where all the workers mm. work, which is, uh, you know, everything has its own imagery, because at one point, you know, we're kind of sinking down with the employees, and... I think they're actually all painted on and then just the backgrounds moving while they're in the elevator shaft. And that alone yep. was like, that was pretty cool for the artsy person and myself. Um, <laughs> and just like other things that are like, 
just very big and dramatic. You know, I had obviously having watched the film, you you forget things because it is longer. But um, when the crowd is chasing Maria, like, or even just uh, the chase scene itself in the catacombs where Rotwang's trying to attack her, and you know he just wants her. Now I will say I think he. He mainly wanted her because Fredder was into her, right? And he's like, oh, I'm going to get you because revenge. I'm, I'm assuming now while I'm saying it, yes, that's my answer. But <laughs> yeah. at the time, like, why is he bothering her? Just leave her alone. Um, <laughs> uh, I will say they. he also mentions, like, the Tower of Babel. Babel and um, I. that's a part of the movie I have to watch again because it, you know, talked about making metropolis and at first they couldn't and then they related it to Babel. but i think from someone who learned about that in high school i don't really remember what that story was about so i'd have to like you'd have to know the context to kind of really fully piece it together for the film yeah. if that makes sense but uh it, it just it just talks about like you know that how the actors was it talked about lang himself apparently like he was could be cruel to the extras. You know, there's hundreds of extras in this film. And, you know, they would be, like, sitting out in the cold for hours or this, that, and the other. Probably they only got paid, like, $1.50 a day. <laughs> so it, whatever the money was back then. And uh, I guess he was, like, a pretty meticulous, uh, not maybe a slightly harsh director. But, I mean, I'm not, I'm not agreeing to that, but having that type of power gives you a film such as this. Mm. And I'm saying that from experience from also working on a film where the director wasn't that nice. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the final cut is going to look at this movie, so we'll just stop right there. <laughs> mm. You know what I'm saying? So it's a it's a good article just to read. Like I said before, I'll link it in the show notes because he talks about the Thin Man as well. Um why he's i guess uh he talked about also why he switched with georgie uh inmate number one one eight one one um you know just wanting to have see the identity and perspective of the workers it's that's really kind of it it's a uh, i don't know i'm not quite summarizing this as much as i'd like but um that's okay i mean yeah you, you can kind of extract out of the thing that you kind of wanted to, to to highlight right yeah but i will say going back to you know those perspectives that he used with his camera i know you mentioned the one where he's looking for maria there was the one where he goes to grab her ripped dress and you know you we follow his hand i like that right. and the biggest one was like um the the shaky cam i called it or you know, the swinging camera on a pendulum when uh, the dam, it's not the dam burst, but the water pipes burst in the lower level. And it just, they both, mm -hmm. both actors dropped and the camera swung. I don't know. I just thought it was a very cool shot visually. Mm -hmm. And it just, to me, it seemed like it heightened the sense of danger and urgency when it happened. So it just, it's, it's yeah. weird little things like that, like the quirks that yeah. also make this movie more yeah there was, a, there was a oh sorry no i'm done <laughs> uh, there was a in that scene you were talking about i remember that it was there was very noirish um almost a 45 degree angle shift in the camera angle yeah in that in that i thought that was a very good i mean that gave you the feeling of being off balance like all mm -hmm. of a sudden whoa sideways you know yeah definitely that's called the dutch angle by the way was it a yeah. dutch angle huh yeah that's a common thing that uh, filmmakers then and now still use to get you an off uh, balance. The uh, what's a very famous Carol Reed film called uh, uh, The Third Man uh, used that quite extensively. Oh, I love with the Joseph Third Cotton. Man. Because Orson oh, Welles that is came so out the end. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It basically like the story, totally side note, but the story of the film is that you got the American in Europe and nobody speaks English and he's trying to ascertain what's going on with his friend who was supposedly murdered and so like uh it's that's why the camera's off balance because he can't quite get his grip on what's going yeah. on 
Yeah. And so all, every camera if you angle seen adds it, to that. Got it. Yeah. Add it, <laughs> add it to the list. Add it to the list. Add it to the list. Yeah, oh, it's a must-see movie. No question. It's one of the best noir films ever made. Yep. There are many. <laughs> hmm. Um, kind of uh, going back a little bit to the question you have about the context of the the Babel thing. There, there are two references to that. So uh, the first thing is uh, the towel, the towel, the towel, the tower of Babel. <laughs> yeah. I can't speak that. Mm-hmm. So that comes from Genesis eleven. I'm just pulling this up. Um, Genesis eleven says, "Now all the earth." use the same language in the same words and it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plane in the land of this is post um no this is pre i think it's pretty fun settle there and then they said to one another uh, uh no this is post now come let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly and they use bricks of stone and da, 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 da. i keep fast forwarding here come and they said come let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and Let's make a name for ourselves, otherwise we'll be scattered abroad over the face of all the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower with, uh, which the men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have, all have the same language, and this is what they've started to do. Now, nothing which they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, so that they will not understand one another's speech. The Lord scattered them abroad. They are over the face of all the earth. They stopped building the, the city. Therefore, is named Babel, uh, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there, the Lord scattered them, brought over the face of all the earth. Of course, this passage, right? It's in the Bible. It's talking about God and its relationship with people here. But in the actual movie, when it talks, and when it when um, Maria, the character, which is in the catacombs, talking to the workers down below, it basically filtered out everything to do with the Lord. Because it's really talking about the city and man building the city, right? And that's that's the extent of what she's talking about. This is that's what I was referring to earlier. It, she didn't talk about God or the Lord at all. She was basically saying, man, when building the city, uh, you know, there's elements of like the pride is gonna uh, destroy whatever. You know, it, it it didn't have to do with the actual passage of from the scripture. You know what I mean? Like it basically filtered the the God element right. out, right? Right. Hmm. That's what I was trying to reference earlier. But the, but the principle behind why it was brought in, and clearly it's called Babel because it is a concept from the Bible. Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But the basic concept behind it is that when when a, when a large group is unified, they can do so much more and have so much power, whereas the leadership, those are, those are ruling class, will intentionally keep a large group that that poses a possible th- a potential threat at odds against different factions within themselves to keep them unaware of their potential and that yeah. i felt very strongly in this movie hmm. yeah so I that's I was, why i brought in the tower of battle the story of battle entirely so yeah and so I, i'm scrolling through the movie and in the movie it says today i shall tell you the legend, the construction of the tower, tower of Babel. I keep saying towel. <laughs> the tower. The tower <laughs> construction of the tower of Babel. It's quite the shower. It is quite the difference. <laughs> yeah. So she recounts it in the catacombs, right? When the workers are going to her after their work schedule shift right. and they're tired. Because it's, come, let us build a tower whose zenith shall reach unto the stars, right? Mm-hmm. And it goes, I'm just going to redo the, the just... titles. And, and at the tower of zenith, we shall write, okay. great is the world and its maker, and great is man. Right? And it shows right. the tower. Maybe I did hear the whole story, and I just was just thinking it was part of the film. <laughs> yeah. And that and was me thinking, she was talking to them saying, you unified have so much power. Right. But who those who had conceived of the Tower of Babel could not build the Tower of Babel. The task was too great, so they paid wages to outside hands. Mm. Right? Mm. Makes sense. So it's like a uh, 
you know, it, it's it's basically just for the movie, right? It's it's obviously nothing. Like, it's nothing like the passage right from the Bible just read, which has right. to do with God and its people, right? But the hands that built the power babble knew nothing of the dream, of which the head had conceived it, had been fantasizing, which basically kind of goes to the core of the message of the movie, and it goes babble. And what does it say? And it keeps showing the hymns and praise of, uh, what does it say? It keeps repeating Babel. And it says, the hymns and praise of one man became the curses of others. And it repeats the, the, the theme of the, the same language yeah. is spoken, but these men did not understand one another. The explanation of why they need the mediator. Yeah. Great is the world's maker and great is man. And then it, it repeats the theme of even towards the end of the movie, which is um, the head and the heart. Yeah. The head and the hand. Need the head and the, the, head hand and the hands require a mediator, which is the heart, essentially. Yeah. 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 The, the, and the, the head and the hands must be the heart. And that was like the, the very closing scene in the movie was the father shaking hands with the foreman. Exactly. Because mm. the son is the heart, right? He's the mediator. He's the heart that yeah. links the head, which is the father, and the worker is the son, right? There's a there's a union rep, essentially. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the worker, right? And he's the hand, right? He's the worker. That's, that's it. And exactly. the son is the mediator, which is the heart. And then the father is the head, right? He's just all head but no heart, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then later on, this is just to explain the way some of the uh, Babel imagery that you were you had questions about. But he, uh, uh, the son, uh, what happens? Is the son comes out, and then he basically like faints or something. You know, he he goes down a lot, and so he's in his bed, right? He's sick or something. He's ill. And his dad's checking on him. Uh, but when he wakes up, he has uh, a hallucination or maybe a vision. And that's when the thin man comes to visit him, right? And so in his vision, the thin man becomes like a preacher person mm -hmm. with the Bible. Right, right. right? Weird, and it, weird. Yeah, that's his vision, right? So, and and then he quotes from the scripture. Verily I send to you the days of which the apocalypse speaks draws nigh. And he's quoting, of course, from Revelation 17, which uh, I won't do the whole thing, but it, uh, the relevant passage of it is 1 to 18 or something, saying, And then came one of the seven angels with seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will hew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried it away, and me away, and the, this me is the author, the John of Revelation, the Apostle John, uh, in the spirit of the, into the wilderness. And I saw a woman set upon the scarlet-colored uh, beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, a woman arrayed in purple and scarlet color. And decked with gold and precious on and on on. The, the key factor is upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw, I wonder with great admiration, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are da 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 da. <clears throat> and it goes on. So and that plays a lot yeah. into the way. Um, Bridget Helm was playing the character at, when exactly. she became the robot. It was really manic and crazy, you know? Mm. Well, the, the audience is looking at her. We're saying she represented all seven sins, right? Come to life. Right. right. Exactly. Which would probably drive anyone crazy. Okay. <laughs> I didn't catch that one part. So, so glad you brought so it up. In, so in the context of the Bible, when he, when he was talking about that specific passage, so Babylon was uh, an empire in the four five hundred BC around circa around that time, but, but a couple of hundred about half a millennia before 
Yeah, it's like uh, Mesopotamia or something like that. Yeah, around the uh, those you know modern day Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. like all that region near the uh, that uh, the the body of water next to India. I forgot what it's called now, but so like that area um, uh, used to belong to an empire, Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is one of the most famous ones from the Book of Daniel. Long story short, that uh, Babylon, the empire, used to be kind of the be all and end all. Like they ruled the known world at that point, right? Basically, like Alexander the Great ruled basically the same places. That whole notion of Babylon basically means it represents, uh, in the in that context of scripture, I was just saying, it represents man its greatest pride and height of this. The uh, represents the pride, height of its pride. Basically, it's like you know. Uh, Babylon represents man being saying, I am God himself. I'm better than God. I don't need God. I am Babylon. That's what Babylon is mm -hmm. representative of that. Mm -hmm. So in the context of scripture, it's, it's talking about the horror of Babylon. Uh, it's the imagery. It's, it's the fact that uh, Babylon, the notion, the concept of Babylon throughout scripture it is representative of man, the pride of their own, the sin of pride of how, prideful they are as, as as human and then like god humbles the the pro the pride right the, the 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 people with pride you know by bringing everything to a conclusion in the apocalypse which is why it's in revelation right that's the context of the horror of that one that's the whole concept behind it now bringing invoking that imagery and even when you woke up he was like dreaming of reading the revelation of saint john right by avalon publishing <laughs> He was reading it, mm. so that's where he fell into a stupor and vision and stuff. So, I think that's the tie, the imagery, and this, and the concept, in the context of the tide of scripture, and both in the Tower of, of uh, Babel and the Horror of Babylon. The whole idea is that Babylon represents uh, humanity trying to be great himself, and 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 by trying to be be great. They enacted a lot of injustices in, in the class struggles that they have by having people who are higher up, like CEOs, managers, and they're getting all the benefits in, in their gardens of the lights while the workers down there are like slaving to death, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like a little bit of, uh, a little bit, of, I think, criticism of capitalism a little bit. I think that certainly was in his mind. It's the rise of post industrialization, uh, you know, during the era of time. And you could, they could see the effects of, manufacturing industrialization industrialization of people working to death you know literally mm -hmm. in the factories you know yep Does that resonate definitely um, mm -hmm. you think that that Absolutely. there's some there's some ties i think that's why he's using some of that religious imagery it's Absolutely. Just, yeah so hopefully that's not too off topic <laughs> Sorry, no, it's a lot of information, but I mean, yeah, you're trying to you yeah. have some questions about that, so I was trying to mm. bring some context to the table. <laughs> no, that's what you need for the podcast. I mean, we're silent films, so if we don't yeah. know what's going on, <laughs> there you go. But I think you find that uh, a lot of silent filmmakers have that uh, background, and I think they do uh, bring allude to that often in their films. This he's not alone, I think. In doing that, they, a lot of uh, filmmakers frequently reference scripture for some of those purposes. It presupposes you know some of this context, right? In Sunday school, so many people were going to Sunday school back then. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. So, any parting thoughts? I think that's probably good enough for this particular one. I mean, we could probably spend all night talking about it because it's it's a really dense movie. Mm. And it, and it, like we just talked about, it, it goes into depth and calls upon and alludes to so many different things, whether it's scripture, whether it's class, whether it's political systems, whether it's um, science fiction elements, whether it's technology. Oh, and even like we haven't even talked about how technology could corrupt and stuff like that, you know? <laughs> we haven't even gotten there, you know what I mean? <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I think we, I think hopefully we gave people a, good idea of what the film's about. 
Yeah, I think we mm. we got them started. Hopefully, and uh, you definitely check it out. It's available on Kino uh, on the US side. And I think if you're in the Europe region, there is a um, Master of Cinema by Eureka Entertainment. They put out similarly good quality um, products out there. I'm not sure where streaming because you never know what's streaming. You know, There's certain copyrights it could be no mm. It could be here. It could be there. I'm pretty sure it's got to be on, um, if you're in the right region, the uh, Criterion channel, pretty sure it is. I don't have it, so I don't really know. Uh, but maybe it's on Canopy. I didn't look for it, but maybe it is. Um, again, if you're in a region that can access that. But for, I think non-US, most of the times you just have to get the physical media because that's really the only way you can enjoy the, the movies. Yeah. Um, anyway. So, any parting thoughts about Metropolis before we wrap it up? Uh, yeah, Fritz Lang pulls out all the stops on what critics claim today is a creative masterpiece, and at the time wasn't considered an exact flop, but wasn't as well received, possibly because of the cutting when it left the country. But it's uh, certainly a movie that is represented into today's society and it can be seen and it has been used heavily throughout the last you know 70 years almost 100 years of uh influence so that's kind of all i have to say um you can't really watch like a sci-fi film today without something harking back to this mm. and potentially uh lang's other work as well which we should all just check out eventually by ourselves. <laughs> if he was already such a great director by this point, you know, what was he producing like two years prior? Yeah. I mean, he did, uh, that, uh, Lord of the Rings, like epic right before this, I think. Mm. And that was a massive production too. And after this, he did, I think one, maybe two more silence, probably just one more called uh, a woman on the moon, which is, but that's what it's about. A woman. On the moon. But, uh, mm -hmm. it, it imagines, uh, you know, space travel, like, at least they really tried to imagine. It was kind of like a little bit like 2001 Space Odyssey a little bit of its day. Because if you remember when uh, 2001 Space Odyssey came out, it gave people a vision of the future of what it would look like if you were to get on a plane and then connect a flight to space, you know, travel in space, you know, fly to the moon. It gave people a vision of the future that could be possible. I think it was one of the interesting parts that people really love about 2001. It gave you an experience, right? And in the next uh, maybe couple of decades, it might be possible. I mean, SpaceX right now, uh, you know, the Elon Musk uh, company, as well as Jeff Bezos, Blue Origins, they're trying to do that. They're trying to give first the rich people, of course, but eventually <laughs> that, the goal is to... Say, okay, I'm going to pay, you know, a couple hundred dollars and I go right to the moon and back. Space tourism, mm -hmm. you know? And what we thought in 2001 when that first came out in the 60s, like, oh, that's crazy. It could be possible in the next few potential decades. You could be hitching a flight to tour the moon and back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They already made the self-landing rockets. That was right. incredible when I saw that on TV. Like you, you can't you can't make that up. That is the that is the dream of fantasy right there in sci-fi. So certainly within the next hundred years, it'll be happening. I mean, they just had the rover land on Mars, right? So, but anyways, th that's the point is that he was making that in nineteen twenty, like eight twenty nine, a year or one or two years after this, he made a a movie, the silent film called A Woman on the Moon, which is his attempt to try to make like space travel. Of reality, you know. So he, he did another one, I think, after this. I think I've seen everything of his, Rich Lang. I'm pretty sure. Uh, there's a, probably a few that weren't available to me 20 years ago, but I, I've probably seen the whole thing. Um, his final films were pretty spectacular. Really, really, really epic. Um, anyways, that's that's later on. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Bob, any parting thoughts? No, not really. I mean, I recommend the film overall. Would you say it's like a classic of silent film, or is, is it ranked pretty high? Oh, absolutely. It's, like it's, another... it is, it's definitely a classic of silent films. Yeah, yeah. How about just films in general for you, beyond 
silent. You know, on silent films? Where does it stand? Yeah. Like, would you put it up with uh, what we were just talking about earlier? Was that Magnificent Seven, for example? <laughs> well, I made a, a I made a list of my top fifty recommended films. It's not on it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't put it on it. It's yeah, yeah. It's I. I would say that in all honesty, that I think that it's more a film for for, for people who like silent films. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I don't think it's. I don't think it's a general. Um, I don't think it's for the general palate. Yeah, but I will. I will, I will say that it's surprising how how many people who don't normally watch silent films, we'll watch this even above beyond the, the Chaplin comedies. They'll take this film over the comedies. Shockingly. Mm. So. Sci-fi. It's, it's such a popular genre. It, it is, yeah. Especially That's now, true. right? With the Marvels and everything nowadays, people like yeah. that stuff. And they this is often on, like, if you were to write a top 10 move silent films of all time list, this is on it for sure. Almost. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Up there with the general. Yeah, <laughs> that's also another title on this top whatever list. And uh, I would say for yes. me, uh, even beyond silent films, I really enjoyed it. Um, I haven't seen it since that screening, uh, probably a decade or more ago now. And uh, that's really made a lasting impression on me. It, continues to deepen my love of silent films, I think, uh, if anything. Um, I would rank this above many sound films, I would say, because the technique in this film, the uh, technical prowess, a lot of it is just timeless. You know, the way he filmed the movie, the way he performed the visual effects, the way he strung the story together, the way he alluded to some of those multiple layers that we just barely scratch the surface of talking about. I mean, I love that about films and I love that films like this uh, of this caliber is, uh, is even remarkable that it's still accessible to us, right? And restored in great high definition quality and with all the, even though it's really scratchy and not really uh, good with the 16 millimeter backup copy, but still it's accessible. The fact that we can actually even watch it is a miracle, right? It survived. Mm. Uh, near a uh, hundred years ago now. So, so for all those reasons, you know, like we all said, it's definitely required viewing. Uh, even if you don't watch any silent films, this is uh, highly impactful for silent film, uh, for film history in general, not just silent films. It's remarkable um, across many fronts, you know. Um, anyways, highly recommended for all three of us. So that wraps up our main feature review of the last silent film that uh, we're going to talk about. And as I talked about it, it, it basically anticipated the last few episodes, this is kind of the final one. And, you know, my the reason why is that, you know, simply that I just don't have enough time um, to continue in the same way that uh, we've been going, you know, for the last, this is probably the 52nd episode year plus we've been going at it for a lot of it week by week and uh, it's not the fact that it's exhausting it's the you know and i love and still enjoy doing it it's the fact that i want to do other things as well and there's just simply not enough minutes in the day to squeeze in to do everything you know it's kind of like a young man's game <laughs> broadcasting mm. or any of this type of creative endeavor i think you gotta like you know have a huge you know, amount of free time that you want to invest in and, and get it rolling. And I wish I did this like 20 years ago, but the reality is I don't have that time these days. And uh, I do have other things I want to get to uh, more in terms of priority than this. So, and that's what we'll be talking about next. So that's, that's really the reason why that um, I, I need to conclude and end this podcast. Um, I will say never say never, meaning like, you know, you could say, yeah, I'm going to be done forever. It's really hard to say that because you never know if circumstances could change. One day, you know, I win the lottery and I'll turn this <laughs> one time job. You know, and... <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever. You know, the point is you never know. But um, for the time being, I do want to bring it to a conclusion. 
and so that you know i, I want to be doing other things you know which we'll get to towards the end of what we're going to you know uh wrap up with and in, in terms of what we're doing uh, afterwards but yeah that's the reason so that's pretty much it is that kind of clear for you guys too probably i mean we talked about before but you never know season two could be right around the corner whoa <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I say never, never, but you know, uh, my hope is is that um, you know somewhere down the path that somebody picks this up and kind of keeps it running. It, it it has been set up in a way that somebody could, perhaps even you, if you're listening to this, you know, if you're interested in hosting a podcast and keep it running, you're passionate about silent films as a listener, but maybe you you want to participate too. Um, it was a bit hard work, but I think if you really love it, and enjoy it. it it's kind of fun. At least for me, it's been fun and still is fun. Um, I just have a little bit of capacity and, and I want to be doing other things that I think I want to spend more time doing rather than this one. And yeah, like I said, I still enjoy it. I still love it. Um, I wish I had all the time in the world to, to continue it, but I just don't. So I have to kind of pick and choose, you know, what I do with my time, you know, and that's yep. what it comes Everything down to. Everything has its time and place. Yeah. So I would say that that's why I wanted to go ahead and say this is kind of concludes my uh, involvement with uh, watching sound films at this point. Um, I do want to say thank you heartily to Lily first because she said yes to you know agreeing to start recording this uh, on a whim on a lark as it were. You know, when we first caught each other. I didn't know. I mean, you never know with uh, and we're literally just you know initially strangers on the internet. <laughs> So, but now we're kind of familiar. We we know how you know we can do the co-hosting of the podcast, and you got some experiences under your belt, Lily, between you and me. And and now we added Bob in there, five or six episodes in. So, thank you, Lily. Thank you, Bob, for really making this all of this possible. Uh, it's just it, one of the dreams come true, really, for creating something. I think. Before this, I don't think I've ever in my life created anything creative, just in general, like this. So wow. this is a very creative endeavor, um, and I I love doing it, and I loved producing, creating, recording this podcast with with you, Lily, and Bob, and and all the guests that we've had on in the past. And so I, I thank you, Lily, and thank you, Bob. I, I probably don't say that enough on the podcast itself. So yep. So well, the last time, <laughs> thank you. And thank you Probably. for having us, or me at least. I appreciate being involved, and you're asking me if I want to be involved. So, thank you. And yeah, uh, both of you yeah. added uh, tremendously uh, to the value of podcasts, and uh, honestly, just made all of this possible. So, again, very much thank you for both of your time and uh, involvement and making all of this possible and Lily for posting things and uh, maintaining uh, all those things afterwards and writing and taking notes in the descriptions and stuff like that. So I like it. Any, any parting <laughs> thoughts before we move on to kind of, uh, you know, what we're going to do afterwards, what we're going to work on. Well, I'll throw in my thank you for, uh, you know, also wanting to do this because, you know, being one of the younger people on this podcast, I'm pretty sure not many people my age in their mid to late 20s are into silent films, given that, you know, they are practically 100 years old or are over 100 years old. Um, this really opened my eyes to, like, today's film industry, which is what I'm trying to pursue um, so it's nice to see our past throughout the world when it comes to filmmaking and what we do now, as you know, we were saying with Metropolis, all these, um, te film techniques that the, he was doing, you know, 95 years ago, and some of them we still use today. So, um, I have watched a lot of films in the near two years we've been doing this podcast, so, that's uh that's more inspiration for you know creativity like i am a writer i do write a lot so having no and knowing that these films exist not saying like obviously no copyright infringement but <laughs> seeing you know stories of the past and bringing them kind of forward in the future and using what you've learned and seen 
you can kind of, I don't know, it's very inspirational. And that's, that's kind of all I have to say. Uh, silent films aren't dead. They're not, you know, obscene. They're not horrible. They're of value. And I think more people need to appreciate them. You know, there's only so many silent film festivals out there. And uh, it's a forgotten, it's a forgotten art. And really, it should be brought back up to speed in our modern time. Because you don't always need dialogue to have a story progress. I bet you've seen more silent films in the last couple of years than you have modern films. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't you, even you, lie. Yeah, I can't even deny what you, it. Based <laughs> on what you told me, you, you only watch movies in piece, bits and pieces, right? Except that this podcast has forced you to watch complete movies of the, the silent era. So you probably have seen, you've seen complete movies of the silent films way more than you've seen the modern movies. <laughs> well, if they're not totally complete, can we really say that? Mm. That's what I'm saying. You still, you still <laughs> saw as much of the footage of the films that you have, right? For sound mm -hmm. films that you can have access to versus a lot of the modern films from what you're saying that you, you've only yeah. watched some pieces of. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so we've done, we've done you right by having you watch complete movies. Yes! <laughs> yeah. Well, all right, guys. So I'm going to um, get to kind of taking us out with what we're going to work on next. Um, I have been recording. I'm going to uh, post uh, all of this soon. Hopefully by the time you're listening to this, it'll be out. But I'm working and have been uh, working on this other passion of mine. Again, more podcasting. And it's called uh, Classic Science Fiction Literature Podcast. And uh, our Sweet. goal focus is to read either short stories or novels of classic science fiction era. Uh, books, things like uh, Asimov, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Heinlein, and, uh, you know, all those greats. All those greats. Radbury and on. So, H.G. Wells? Uh, perhaps. Perhaps. Actually, Ooh. that's prior, That's the prototypical science fiction. H.G. Wells and uh, Jules Verne, those are predecessors yeah. of the modern golden age of science fiction, I call hmm. it. Yeah. which reigned from the 30s, 40s, and 50s and beyond. So still in the old stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that's, um, yeah, if you search for on Apple and or any podcast, wherever you get podcasts to search for, classic science fiction literature podcast, and I think you'll be able to find us along the way. Um, that's what I'll be doing after this. Uh, and by the way, um, it, uh, if you are still interested in, um, sort of, you, you have a, uh, silent film itch to fill as it were, there's two places I recommend you go, uh, as listeners, uh, even though this podcast might come to end, you can check out movies silently. Uh, Fritzy's doing an amazing, has been doing an amazing job, and I think she has a Patreon as well. Highly recommend all the stuff she's doing, both on her review site as well as her own Patreon. I think she does some audio, perhaps podcasts. I don't really know. I didn't really look into it. But if you're looking for um, kind of a replacement, as it were, or something to kind of continue to fill your void of silent films, I highly recommend her stuff, whether it's the reading through what she's written or I think she has some additional content behind the Patreon wall, but um, yeah, go check her out. It, uh, nothing like it. It's, you know, I would, hell, I would even say that's better than what we do here because in the sense that she goes really deep. Like she's read hundreds, if not at this point, thousands of silent films. And mm -hmm. uh, her depth of knowledge is just uh, second to none in terms of silent films. She can tell you about all sorts of film techniques that have occurred uh, prior to even the, the the height of silent films in 1927 and so on. So highly recommend that we've referenced her throughout our, our, our journey in her podcast here. And uh, certainly if you want to, 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 to pay, pay, sort of have a patron at somewhere, that's the place I highly recommend to, to, to go to for silent film needs. Now for the classic film needs, I highly recommend checking out uh, Mike Gibbard's uh, Nitrateville. Uh, he has a Nitrateville podcast. Just search for Nitrateville or just search for Nitrateville Google and there he's a forum that he maintains 
I'm off. I'm often frequently on there uh, chatting in the silent sub forum as well. Uh, so you'll still, still see me on there asking questions and stuff like that. So highly recommend you check that out. They talk about vintage films, so it'll include talkies as well, in addition to silent films. But he does often talk about silent films. So those are the two places that I'd say that I um, subscribe to uh, to get my vintage film uh, stuff uh, to fixes, you know. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much it for me. So um, what you're working on, Lily? What's what's next for you? Well, I'm not always 100% sure about the future, but right now I am a part of the upcoming, I would say, production company based out of the Worcester area in Massachusetts. Um, we're called Pure Dice Films. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram. We have a website. Um, YouTube. The last, and uh, do we have a YouTube? We do, well, we do have our I YouTube so. page. Yeah. yeah. You, <laughs> so search for you don't over me. Dice. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, we have, uh, we've had a lot of very good reviews and compliments. Well, that's where you can watch your stuff, right? Pure Dice, that's where you can watch your stuff is on YouTube. <laughs> well, we have our website. We have our yeah. other things, but yeah. Yeah. Ooh. And that's it. Awesome. And you, Bob? What you have well, been working on? And Well, a, a hobby hopefully turned profitable is uh, I design board games. I've done it all my life, and I've been working on a game for the past uh, six to seven years now that I'm hoping I'll have complete soon and on the market. It's called Sword of Legends, and it's a fantasy you strategy. You the name, right? It's going to be the same name, right? So people can find it. <laughs> it will be Sword of Legends, yes. Okay, good, good, good. Just and <laughs> uh, it's a fantasy strategy board game. Um, pretty, pretty deep thought, hopefully easy to play. Um, so, yep, I'm hoping that'll be done in uh, a few months from now. Awesome. And on the market. And uh, where it'll be on the market, that's kind of hard to say. But uh, eh, hopefully hopefully it gets around uh, in, before your eyes. Yeah, where we get board games from, I'm sure it'll be there. Uh, what's it called? Sword of Stones? Sword of Legends. Sword of Legends. Sword of Legends. So where you yep. get your board games from? Sword of Legends. Look for it coming yep. soon. My, the com next. my company is called Catazeev. Catazeev's Workshop. Hmm. Well, you're going to have to spell See. that, Bob. <laughs> I'll no, spell it for them. <laughs> Catazeev's Workshop. Uh, he's, he's a wizard. <laughs> that's, all all, that's all that he is to remember. Okay. All right. So that's what we're working on next. And um, that's it for us. Uh, it was fun, and uh, it's been swell. It's been great. Uh, thank you, listeners. Thank you for, for having us those... along. Yeah, thank you, Lily. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, listeners, for making all this possible and uh, allowing us to kind of uh, just chat and um, hopefully uh, drop some knowledge along the way. Uh, if not, you can... Uh, just enjoy the sound of my voice. <laughs> it's an enjoyable voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm just making it for myself, and I just listen to myself right now. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, everybody, and uh, we're gonna take us out from here. And uh, uh, goodbye, Alvida Zen, Alvar, however you say now, however many languages you can say, and uh, take us out. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Good night. Bye. Take care.